There has never been a better time to be alive. And the reason I say that is, if you go back and look at the human history, this is probably one of the most innovative decade in the human history that we are living through. Everything that we know about who we are is about to change. In the next 10 to 15 years, we will change the trajectory of how humanity is going to live. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the moonshots. And what is it moonshot is? And how we are able to go out and execute on them. So let's start with something. This is the first time when individuals and a small group of people are able to do things that only the superpowers did before. Whether it is landing on the moon or solving the problem of healthcare, education, creating abundance of energy, creating the abundance of agriculture, food, and creating abundance of fresh water. All the things that we find scarce, the things that we think are valuable, what if they become the next air? All of us can sit in one room and never fight over oxygen and the air because inherently we believe they are in abundance. What if everything that we value becomes so abundant they become the next air? They become the next oxygen, the abundance of food that everyone has it democratized and demonetized. And I'll tell you how we do that. Abundance of fresh water, abundance of energy, and what abundance of land. So I'm going to start about, I'm going to talk about two moonshots that I'm currently working on. One of them is the literal moonshots that you might be seeing behind me. That is landing on the moon. Why go to the moon? Remember John F. Kennedy when he says, we chose to go to the moon. And if he was a businessman, he would have said, because it's a good business. Right? So we didn't choose to go to the moon because it's easy. We chose to the moon because it is a great business. And the reason what makes it a good business is, it is something worth doing. Imagine all of us humans as a species live on a single spacecraft, and we call that a spacecraft planet Earth. What if our spacecraft gets damaged because we get hit by a large asteroid? What if we are damaged ourselves because of climate change? It's not that the planet will die. It is the species, we human species may not survive. What if we became the dinosaurs? If you could hear every dinosaur rolling in their grave, what would they be saying to you? or amongst each other, they would be saying, if they had one good entrepreneurial dinosaur, they would be roaming on the moon and the Mars and beyond. It didn't happen to them, so let's go out and make that happen. So my first moonshot is to create a multi-planetary society. What if we could live on the planet Earth and we could also live on the moon? And of course our friends, um, Elon says, let's go to the Mars. And I think I'm gonna have to teach Elon a basic, a basic math the things that are farther away from Earth are harder to come back than the things that are nearer to the Earth, right? If you're going to be going to the Mars anyway, wouldn't it be nicer to learn to live on the moon first? The problems of living on the moon are very similar. The low gravity, uh, vast temperature difference, and lots of radiation, right? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to solve those problems right being while we are close to, the, close to planet Earth? And we all can agree it's better to be a lunatic three days away than to be a Martian six months away. Right, so let's all be a lunatic for, the, for a while. So the idea is when we go to the moon, you say, how would you take care of radiation? Interesting thing is the nature has already solved many of the problems for us. We find the microorganisms living in the radioactive nuclear waste. And these radioactive nuclear waste, these organisms have figured out how to protect its DNA from very high radiation. But more than that, it has figured out how to use radiation as a source of energy. So imagine if we can take the genes from these microorganisms, modify our own genes using CRISPR in vivo, not only we become radiation resistant, we also start to use radiation as a source of energy. That means in the evening when you're walking with your uh, you know, favorite, uh, favorite friend, you can say, instead of going out for a pizza, hey, let's, honey, you want to go out and take a walk and get some radiation. And that will be our food, right? And it's quite possible that we as humans are going to get modified to this new environment. 
And people say, you know, why would you go to the moon? What is out there? How does 16 quadrillion worth of minerals sound? And I'm not a, you know, mathematician. Any which way you look at it, that's a lot of money, right? Now, what are these minerals? These are platinum grade materials. These are rare earth elements, and these are helium-3. Helium-3 is an isotope of helium that actually can be used for fusion energy, and it's a completely clean source of energy. There is no nuclear waste there. A small quantity of helium-3 would power this planet for generations to come. That obviously would be, wouldn't that be amazing to have a clean source of energy that's using a fusion reactor? And many of you are probably thinking in this room, I don't think he knows that we don't have a fusion reactor yet, right? The answer is yes, we don't have a fusion reactor, but we are no more than 10 to 15 years away, just like getting the helium-3 from the moon, we are 10 to 15 years away. And that's the lesson when you're doing a moonshot. Never go where the puck is, go where the puck is going to be. That means we know in 10 to 15 years, when we have a fusion reactor, everyone is going to be saying, hey, does someone have helium-3? And you want to be that guy who says, got helium-3. Right? And that's really what the entrepreneurs do. They get ahead of the things. In the meantime, while you're getting the helium-3, there's some of the amazing things about the moon. It has water. And water is an amazing resource. The ingredients of uh, uh, water, hydrogen and oxygen fuel for rockets, and the fuel for human body. Last couple of months ago, the Japan Space Agency found there is a massive amount of lava tube just under the surface of the moon that's 300 miles long and 30 meters wide. You could put a whole New York City underneath it, and we could just pump the oxygen, and we could create an initial city while we try to adapt the human body to high radiation and low gravity. So all the problems that we see today are simply an opportunity for an entrepreneur to go out and solve the problem. In the meantime, what if we just brought the moon rocks back from the moon? Wouldn't that be amazing? You say, but what, what would somebody do with moon rock? Well, imagine the diamonds never used to be a symbol of love and romance. De Beers in 1950s converted that as a symbol of romance. Moon has been a symbol of romance for centuries. All we have to do is rekindle that romance and make diamond a commodity. So here's how, if I was doing this, here's how I would say. Everyone gives someone a diamond. If you love her enough, you give her the moon. Don't promise her the moon, give her the moon, right? And when you give diamond to some girl, she's going to get up and say, I thought you loved me. You're trying to buy me because if you loved me, you would have given me the moon, right? So don't give me the diamond. And the honeymoon simply about so honeymoon becomes taking your honey to the moon. If you took her to Hawaii, that would be honey Hawaii, not honeymoon, right? So the answer is really in the long term, our future of humanity rests on us becoming a multi-planetary society. And interesting thing is, this is now possible. When I started this company, Moon Express, 10 years ago, people thought it's going to take a billion dollars to get to the moon because that's what NASA would have done. I was absolutely convinced with the exponential technologies we could do it for $100 million. Here we sit here 10 years later, I was completely wrong. Our marginal cost of going to the moon is going to be under $10 million. Think about that for a second here. When I thought I was being 10 times more optimistic, I was actually 10 times pessimistic. And that is the power of exponential technologies. Now, you are able to go to a website and order a rocket for under $5 million. You go to the thing, add to cart, check out, right? That's how you buy rockets now, right? And if you buy three of them, it's a discount there. There's 20% off, right? So what do you do? I bought five of them. <laughs> Right? But the point is, that is the amazing power. You can now 3D print your spacecraft. And the cost of doing things are coming down significantly. The same thing that's making the iPhone cheaper, thinner, and faster is exactly the same set of sensors that are, gonna, that are making the spacecraft lighter and low cost. And that is the beauty of what we can do. So when we land on the moon, not only we become the first private company to do so, we actually symbolically become the fourth superpower. I just want you to understand that. Going to the moon, somebody would say, what gives you the right? We are the only company 
in the universe that has permission to leave Earth orbit and land on any celestial body. So when you hear from our friends, whether it's Elon or Jeff or Richard, they're going to the space, they're all talking about low Earth orbit. I would say get ambitious, boys, right? <laughs> Get ambitious and leave the Earth orbit. And right now, we are the only company that has permission. In fact, President Obama signed into the law before he left that anything that we bring back, we have a complete ownership of it. And that's the beauty, that not only we now have the laws are clear and that shows what entrepreneurs are capable of doing. We did not think about how are we going to get the permission. We always say it will cross that bridge when we get there. And when you, as an entrepreneur, when you cross that bridge, what do you do? You burn that bridge behind you because there is no going back. You're only going to move forward because when you have a bridge intact, you have a temptation to always go back. So keep moving forward and amazing things happen because you care about them. So now I'm going to talk about my second moonshot. That is in the healthcare. I kept wondering that there is only one industry in the universe that actually the more money you spend, the worse it gets. We're spending trillions and trillions of dollars and people are getting sicker and sicker and sicker. What's wrong? And what's wrong is our healthcare system was designed to treat infections, acute care, and today we are all suffering from chronic diseases. Interesting thing is, the chron every single chronic disease, whether you call it Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, depression, anxiety, obesity, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, heart diseases, cancer, every one of them has one root cause. Chronic diseases are caused by chronic inflammation, and chronic inflammation is caused by imbalance of your gut microbiome. So I started a company two years ago, and the technology came out of Los Alamos National Lab, which was designed for the biodefense work. And I just want to tell you that you know I have no background in space. I have no background in computers. I have no background in healthcare. How do I go out and solve these biggest problems and how we are able, to, how you and anyone else can do that? When you are an expert in a field, you become useless in that field. And the reason for that is because the, once you become an expert, you start to take the foundational knowledge for granted. And once you become an expert, the best you can do is to incrementally improve anything. You can never make it 10 times better. You can make it 10% better. And you come from outside the industry, you challenge the foundation of everything people have taken it for granted. So in my case, since I didn't know anything better, what did I do? I start to understand what's making people sick. It turns out the couple of things that I learned. Number one, if you look at the human cells in our body, we have more foreign cells in our body than the human cells. Our human DNA only produces 20,000 genes, whereas the microbes in our gut produce 2 million to 20 million genes. That means from a gene expression perspective, we are less than 1% human. And I always wondered, how do I explain this concept of microbiome or these gut organisms to anyone? And I came up with this tongue-in-cheek story of how humans were created. So just bear with me for a second. So we all know that in the planet Earth, three and a half billion years ago, you start to see the single-cell eucroids, bacteria and viruses. And humans are only a couple of hundred thousand years old. How did we come to be? So here's how I think happened. One day, all the bacteria and viruses and the fungus and yeast and the mold all got together and said, we're sick and tired of living in Africa. We want to take over the world. And they looked at each other, and one of them said, he had a brilliant idea. What is your idea? What if we can create a thing? Trillions of us could live inside it. All we have to do is keep this thing healthy. We can make it crave whatever we want, whatever food we want. This thing is going to go everywhere looking for the food for us. It's going to go everywhere, poop everywhere. It's going to spread us around, and we're going to take over the world. And they created humans. And now, interesting thing happened as they created humans, just like today we are worried about artificial intelligence. These organisms are not dumb. They start to worry. What if this thing we just created became smarter than us? Just like we worry about AI. If AI becomes smarter than us, what's going to happen to us humans? They start to worry. So they reassemble and say, master, master, we have a problem. What's the problem, son? Aren't you worried that we just created this thing called humans? What if they became smarter than us? What are we going to do about it? Master said, don't worry, we solved that problem. How so, master? He said, you know, inside the human cell, the thing they call mitochondria, 
It is one of our brothers. It's the ancient our bacteria that's right inside their cell. Interesting thing is the mitochondria, the bacteria, provides all the energy to their cell. We talk to it all the time. And if these things ever go out of control, we shut their energy and they are done. Master, that's brilliant. But you're not thinking. They're starting to develop this thing called brain. What are we going to do about that? Master says, not to worry one bit. Remember, all of us live in the gut. We put a direct connection from our gut to the brain. Can you believe they call that a vagus nerve? They thought they're going to name it after Las Vegas thinking what happens in the gut is going to stay in the gut. How wrong are they? What happens in the gut goes everywhere. In fact, what makes them feel good? The serotonin thing? We don't let them produce much of that. 90% of that we produce it right ourselves. All the neurotransmitters that go back and forth, we control their behavior, we control their emotions, we control what they think, and we control their prefrontal cortex. So now, just like a good leader, we make them think they are the one who are making the decision. We sit here and keep simply pu keep pulling the strings. So sit back, relax, we have taken over the world. And ladies and gentlemen, that's how the humans were created, right? But all this tongue and cheek story, by the way, you can now Google. There's a nature paper that came out two months ago that how your gut microbiome actually controls our behavior, our emotions, and for their own benefit. In fact, if you Google whether it's a Parkinson's disease or whether you're looking for a cancer, pancreatic cancer, Mayo Clinic published a research on the breast cancer, and uh, last week there was a research on the liver cancer. Not only the microbiome influences the cancer, whether the cancer therapy works or does not work depends on your microbiome. That means whether the chemotherapy works or kills you depends on your gut microbiome. Whether immunotherapy works or does not work depends on your microbiome. So every time you go out there and saying, why do people are getting obese? Why people have diabetes? It is because going back to 2400 years ago, what Hippocrates says, all diseases begin in the gut. One man's food is another man's poison. Let food be thy medicine, let thy medicine be the food. And the interesting thing is there is no such thing, what we have learned is, no such thing as universal healthy diet. The food that's good for you is not good for me, and the food that's good for me today may not be good for me three to four months from now. What we learned is spinach that I thought was healthy, 30% of the people cannot digest spinach, it causes them inflammation. 50% of the people that think when they're eating blueberries or raspberry or walnuts is good for them, it is actually either does no good or it's actually harmful to them. Unless you understand what's going on inside you, you cannot treat your body like a black box. For the first time, we have a shot at making chronic illness optional. And that is my second moonshot of what if we can create a world together where illness is purely an option. And with that, I leave it to you and say thank you.